Good morning. Afternoon. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is well. We are prepared to present to you the second in a series of forums called the Continuing Care 101 series. And forum number two is entitled Levels of Service, i.e. independent living, assisted living, households, that kind of thing. Is that, is that, what, you, is that what you signed up for? Yeah. Okay, you're in the right room. That's a conference joke. I have with me three distinguished people. And we should allow each one of them to introduce themselves. I'm Paul. I'm Adrian. Yay. I'm Christina. Yay. And I'm Kathy. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Bachelor number one. Yeah. <laughs> Adrian is our Associate Executive Director, and Christine is a social worker in the health area. Mm -hmm. And we're still trying to figure out what Kathy does. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I'm a Besides from being full-time Giants fan. That's right. <laughs> Someone said, oh. <laughs> okay, now we'll get started. So what are the various services by setting? Continuing care retirement communities um, categorically have to offer three distinct levels of service. They have to offer within their contract um, independent living, and I am keen on trying to remove the word independent living from our lexicon and replace it with residential living. But I'll probably be all alone in that process for a long time. Assisted living is required to be offered and a level of nursing care and what we call the health care. We often call it HC. So every continuing care community has to have, uh, has to offer in their contract access to those three levels of service. Memory care is sometimes offered, but not always. And we do offer it here, and it is uh, the same licensure as assisted living. It's a different part of assisted living, the different set of rules, and a different offering, but part of assisted living. We at Cedarfield have added names to the mix, which are all very confusing for people. Okay, that everyone agreed. Yes. It's rare that you get everyone to agree on something. <laughs> In assisted living, which is the third floor, which is just down the hall and take a left and go down the hall through the doors, assisted living, that's called Garden Grove. And our memory care area, which is the second floor, which just opened recently, and many of you went to the open house there, is called Morning Glory. And the health care area has three households. And one of them is Poppy Place, one of them is Magnolia Meadow, and one of them is Lavender Lane. So we're gonna attach a name to each one of the slides that talks about each one of those levels of service, just so we can begin to integrate names into the process. Okay? There's a caveat. Every person is different. And every situation is different. And what we try to do when we look at people and where they are most uh, best served, we try to look at the whole person and what's best for them. So nothing is hard and fast. Oh, if I sneeze three times, they're going to take me away. It's, there's nothing like that. 
And we're also, just in purely being honest with you, we're trying to rethink our services, particularly in assisted living, to be sure that we're offering us enough amount of service and we're just rethinking that whole thing um, because we haven't probably looked at it critically in some time. Those are my two caveats. Is that okay? All right, here are the levels of service. I'm going to talk a little bit about independent or residential living, and Kathy Moran is going to help me with that. And Adrian is going to talk a little bit about assisted living, and Christine is going to talk about health care, and Christine is also going to talk about memory care, and then we'll have questions. So residential living, generally speaking, to qualify to live there, a person must be able to live safely without any intervention from Seagerfield to live day to day. Have to live there and live independently, that is without intervention, in order to live safely. So some years ago, I came up with an example, which I don't know is pertinent or not, but it's the best I can do. It's kind of like the difference of a person, let's say, who lives in independent living, who is 80 years old, and who is bound to a wheelchair, who can't transfer from one chair to another, can't get in and out of bed by themselves. And basically, if, we, if there was no intervention on, for someone's, on someone's behalf, they would not be able to live safely. They would end up hurt or malnourished or something bad, some bad outcome would occur. Right? Take that same person and change the circumstances. So let's say back in 1982, some 40 years ago, that person was involved in a car accident at a young age and was left uh, quadriplegic. But that person uh, still, uh, still doesn't have full use, needs others to help them transfer, but continue to have a career, um, continue to work, um, figured out how to drive with specialized vehicles, moved into Cedarfield, and continues to live in that way, makes their own appointments for help to come help them, has the systems worked out. We don't intervene on, with them at any time. So they're dependent on others, but they're independent from us. Do you sort of get the distinction? Yeah, okay. So Kathy's going to talk a little bit about independent or residential living too. Um, talk about sort of what we're looking for. And uh, uh, so Kathy, go ahead. Sure. Hi, everyone. I hope this is clear um, what I'm about to share. Independent living, some of the things Paul was talking about was what we call activities of daily living like bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, feeding oneself. These are all activities of daily living. But there are other things that we have to take care of when we live in independent living, such as groceries, right? We either have to drive to the grocery store and get our groceries, then we gotta bring them back. We have to prepare meals, right? Because we get one meal, a day in independent living so you have to be able to make your breakfast and say your lunch and then you get your dinner you also have to do light housekeeping you have to be able to empty your trash take it to the trash room you have to go and get your mail so there are a lot of things that we call IADLs which are independent activities of daily living that have nothing to do with actually bathing, dressing, all the things that you normally think of. And then the other big thing we have to do in independent living is we have to manage our own medications. So if you're not on a lot of medications, we just brought somebody home, they were on so many, we were like, oh my gosh, if you're not on a lot, it's pretty easy to manage your medications. But if you're on a lot and you're on them three times a day, and you know, that can get really difficult. So what we're trying to share in this today is it's not, it's okay to need help. That's why you're here. So if you find that you're having trouble with your medicines 
or you're not able to remember, did I make a doctor's appointment, didn't I? Did I set up the transportation, didn't I? Did I get my mail today? Any of these things, that's why you're here. So anytime you have these things, that's when you would reach out to Lynette or myself, because those are fixable things that can keep you independent. But if it gets to the point that you're really struggling with your medicines or, you know, say you just had to lose your car keys because the doctor's like you shouldn't be driving anymore, and now you're like, how am I going to get to the grocery store? My kids live out of town. These are times where you can say, you know what? If I go to assisted living at no extra cost, I'm getting three meals a day and three really good meals a day. They're croissant, sandwich for breakfast, I'm telling you, it's the best in the building. It's a little secret. You guys know it now. But I mean, these are things that they're here, and that's why you're at Cedarfield. So again, just remember, if you need more assistance, I know it's hard because we hate to be dependent or not independent, but there are services here, and now we're going to talk about the different services that you all can receive in the different levels of care. Does that make sense? One more word about independent living. There's some, I know there's some folks who are a checklist. I do this, I don't do this. So that's what I'm going to do. This is very general. Every person is different. And when you need those kind of interventions that Kathy was just talking about, um, that's where you can call and we can talk a little bit about how we can provide those interventions to you. Last month, we talked about interventions in the home. So that's an avenue that Kathy and Lynette can help with. Sometimes there just isn't enough intervention in the home uh, to continue to be safe. And that's where we'll be talking about moving to a different environment where lots of supportive services are available to you. Needing help is not a moral failing. It is not weakness. You didn't do anything wrong. We are born and we grow and around the age of 30, we start getting a little less capable and that's just the way that God created us. And there's, we're all going to a point where we'll need a little bit of help. It is not a moral failing. You have done the smart thing um, and you have been able to do the smart thing, which is to move to a community where that kind of support is available to you if and when you need it. Okay? Enough about independent living. We'll come back for questions. I'm going to pass the baton over to my friend Adrian, and she's going to talk some about assisted living. That's what's next. That's what's next. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in most cases in AL, um, you will need assistance with the activities of daily living that Kathy talked about. You may need assistance bathing. You may need assistance having food prepared for you. Um, you may need assistance on coordinating, you know, if you want to help putting on a sweater or something like that. Also, you will need assistance with medication or could. I won't say everyone in assisted living needs assistance with medication, but it's an option that's given to you that the nurses or the medication administration aides can help give you your medication. Also, um, things like an incontinent. Reminder to use the incontinent products or reminder to buy them or um, have them within reach if you go into the restroom. I don't know which one. Okay. Residents that are not appropriate for AL and not AL, uh, the Garden Grove variety of AL. This does not cons uh, include memory care or morning glory. Christina will talk to that in a moment. Residents that are at risk of leaving and getting lost. So if they're not sure where they are, or if they go out a doorway and don't know how to get back in, or confused as to which door is theirs, then they would not be an appropriate person for AL. Cannot independently transfer from a chair, bed, or wheelchair. You need someone to help you do that. Assisted living is a place where you would go where people will help you transfer from your bed, or from your chair to your bed, or vice versa. Need assistance moving around in the AL area. Someone to propel you, push you here or push you there or tell you where to go and what time to get there. And, and assistance turning over or changing position in the bed. 
these things that I just mentioned, the last four, are residents that may not be appropriate for AL. Also in that category, if you have a propensity to fall, if you're falling and falling and falling and therapy can't help you get stronger, um, it's not a situation, like if you have, I'm trying to think of an episode, if you have a bad uh, urinary tract infection and you're really, really weak and we clear up the infection and then you go to rehab and get stronger, you're appropriate. However, if none of that is the case and you keep falling and keep falling, then AL probably is not the best place or the safest place for you to be. If you cannot manage your own incontinence, therefore someone is actually helping you place them or put them on a where them, AL may not be the place for you. And if you need more than a moderate amount of assistance with your dressing, toileting, and other ADLs, AL may not be a place for you. Okay? We're coming back for questions? Yeah, I think we'll come back for questions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can I, can I grab it? Yeah. Oh, just to clarify. So just to clarify real quick. We move into Cedarfield. We have to qualify from a health perspective. We live independently. At some point, we need a little help. And we would qualify for assisted living because we're really not qualifying for independent living any longer. Independent or assisted living is a place where there are two things happening. You're qualifying to come in, and at some point you no longer qualify because your health needs may have advanced to a point where another area is needed. And so that's why Adrian was talking about, here's a person who probably qualifies, and here are some things that you may not qualify for. So I just want to clarify, there's a very clear, because it's right in the middle, people are coming in and people are coming out oftentimes of assisted living. All right, so I'm going to talk about Morning Glory, which is our memory care, which is a part of assisted living, not health care. Um, I like to make sure that that distinction is known um, because just like assisted living, you have to qualify, you also have to qualify for Morning Glory. Um, so generally, our residents in Morning Glory have, you know, cognitive impairment, that doesn't allow them to do certain things or to be safe. So with Morning Glory, um, our residents benefit from having more of a secure and structured environment, um, but they also are able to interact socially, enjoy activities, um, and they you know, eat with um, all the other residents in the dining room. Um, and then what may not make resident, a resident appropriate is requiring more physical needs like what Adrian was saying getting in and out of the bed transferring those kinds of things but also with morning glory when the residents aren't able to socially participate in activities you know that's kind of an indicator that morning glory may not be the place for them anymore All right, healthcare. So, sorry, I love healthcare. Um, so, generally, we like to put that word on there because it's like Paul said in the very beginning with that caveat not all residents in each level of care, you know, are kind of the same. So, generally, residents in healthcare need more support and assistance with bathing, dressing, grooming, those ADLs that we've talked about. Um, they also need more assistance with transfers, getting you know, from the bed to a chair or a wheelchair. Um, they might not be able to propel themselves in their wheelchair and have to be wheeled down the hall. Um, they require medication administration. Um, also, they might display some behaviors that they meet, might need more supervision. So if people are falling more regularly, or if they might have incidences where they, you know, might not be safe going out on their own. And then also, um, residents in healthcare may need help 
with eating. Um, they might not be able to feed themselves anymore. Um, assistance with toileting and incontinence. Um, supervision for falls. And then healthcare is also a great place for that intense rehab for people who are coming out of the hospital. So quick stays, we get you back on your feet, get you to your baseline, and we send you back to your level of care. Questions? Okay, we only have the one mic. I don't know if Eddie is still in here. Okay. So ask the question and then I'll run it back to the panelists so they can answer. <laughs> what is the process of deciding how one transfers to one level to the next? Yes. I love it, Miss Bisky. So Barbara, that's a great question. Um, and we really don't know, right? Because as Paul says, we're all individuals and we have to look at what is truly needed. But I brought this so that you all can see it. When you first come into Cedarfield, this assessment is done on you. It's the Virginia Uniformed Assessment Instrument. And basically, it's kind of, oh, this is a very short form, there's a longer form, but it basically tells Cedarfield, this is what I need help with. Um, I can do this, but I can't do this. And we always base the assessment on, on your worst day. So I have a bad back. I don't know if anyone has a bad back, but as you know, with a bad back, some days are better than others. On your worst day, what do you need help with? That's how we do this assessment. And then it's strictly just checking boxes and then our experience also incorporating what you guys want. Um, it'll give us a very good indicator of where you can get the assistance that you need. Um, so that is truly the best way to kind of find out. Then there are other people that tell Lynette and I, I don't care what I score, Kathy, I'm staying in my apartment come heck or high water. You know, it's still good to do this so that we can tell maybe the caregivers coming in or the assistants coming in, what exactly it is you're needing assistance with. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention that I think is a huge point that I've learned over the years, two things. One, as couples, we don't age the same. And I think I mentioned this last time. We do not age the same. So as the female, you might have physical impairments that you can't get around like you used to and maybe your husband has cognitive issues or vice versa that is why you're in a place like Cedarfield and it happens even though it's the hardest thing to do where your loved one is in a different level of care and can get the care and assistance they need and you in turn can visit and not have to go to say a different you know locale um, but it's just something to, again, no shame. That's why you're here, because we all have different needs. And it's okay to have one spouse needing one thing and another spouse needing another thing. So and the last thing I'm going to add, this is the best thing. When I worked on memory care, having not worked in assisted living or memory care, I was like, oh, gosh, I just assumed people were going to be sick. They're out going on the bus ride to the airport, then they're running to Denny's, and they're... They just need supervision, but physically they're fit, if you think of it that way. They might need cues, like let's all go to the bathroom now, but they're able to go into the bathroom, go use the restroom, wash their hands, and then they're ready to go. So memory care truly is assisted living. It's not the reputation of somebody is very ill. They need more, as Christina said, structured routine with activities, because that's the exercise the brain needs just like rehab is the exercise the body needs. And I would put an addendum mm -hmm. onto Barbara's question about process. Um, so I would say that the process of moving from one area to another begins in conversation. So conversation with a social worker and you and or whoever is your responsible party, oftentimes that's an adult child 
that you've chosen, or, or both children, a physician, those kinds of conversations. People uh, can, we can uh, start having a conversation for a couple of reasons. One is you or your spouse might come to us and say, I want to have a conversation about me or my spouse. Sometimes it's about spouse, about me too, because I'm worn out. Sometimes a staff person might come forward and say, Mrs. X or Mr. X is not acting right. Um, something is wrong. Something seems off with them. And so we might have a conversation. That's not tattletaling. That's just being, uh, that's caring about people and bringing it to Kathy's attention. So we begin a conversation. Tools like the uniform assessment tool and other kinds of things, visits to doctors, neurologists, all kinds of things depending on your situation. So there's not a checklist sort of process as much as there's a conversation, an assessment, and figuring out how we can make sure that you remain in the least restrictive environment that's best for you. And sometimes that's assisted living. Sometimes it's nursing or a set or healthcare, we call it here. And sometimes it's being at home with some help. That's a good question to get us started. Other questions? What I'm missing here is a flow chart. So if we, most of us are in independent living, we can then go to assisted living or memory care, which is really an alternative assisted living. But eventually we're all gonna end up in healthcare, perhaps, unless we die of a heart attack or something. Am I understanding that as a flow chart? No, no. I'd really like some arrows with the arrows weighted by Number of pe a number of residents making these various transitions, to be quite honest, as a scientist. <laughs> so I can tell you that we could make a flow chart, but I don't know how accurate it would be. Um, you know, every resident is different. We have some residents who are in independent living and go straight to healthcare. We have residents that go from independent living straight to morning glory. So it's all about how people progress and the disease process of whatever disease they have. I guess I understand that. I'm happy for. I understand that. I guess what I'm doing is asking for a chart with arrows that have different thickness depending on how many people do that, sort of a probability type of thing. Mm. But again, I'm coming from a scientific background. So you just want the data. Exactly. Okay. I would say that in a textbook, which doesn't really have it, a person would live independently, and then they would need a little help, and that may, they might utilize assisted living, and then they might need a little more help, and they might utilize the healthcare, one of the health, healthcare households. And that would be what one would think would happen, and probably happens most often. But there are these times when a person what happens a lot is a person will just wait for assisted living. I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going. And be hanging on by their fingernails in their apartment. And then some occurrence happens and whoop, straight to healthcare. And they're like, what about assisted living? Well, you waited through that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> through that process. And you don't qualify for that. You really qualify for healthcare. So that can happen. I worked with a man once who lived in independent living and was very sick and moved to assisted living. And, it, and his brother then divested of his things so they could fit into assisted living. And then he got worse and he went to healthcare. And then he got better and he went back to assisted living. And then he got a lot better and he moved back to independent living. He's the only person I've ever worked with who went down, or went, who went through the continuum back again. We had like, somebody, I need all my stuff back. <laughs> we, went, we had somebody who went from memory care to assisted living. So, um, it's like Paul says, it really does depend. I do now working over in IL though, Anne will say to me so long, they've waited too long, Kathy. They've waited too long. And that's okay if you want to wait, you know, an independent living, but as Paul says, you will skip a lot of times assisted living because at that point you're needing more help. This is not a provo for assisted living, but it's sort of like moving to a retirement community. 
Some people wait too long and they just don't enjoy all the things that can happen. And assisted living, I would say, is that way. There's a lot of things that happen there and it's a shame to skip it. Uh, but people do. Besides the lovely names of Poppy Place, et cetera, is there any difference between one household and another in healthcare? Good question. All right, that is a great question. So as of right now, um, so Lavender Lane, we are transitioning to our dementia healthcare. Skilled. Skilled. Oh, dementia skilled healthcare. Sorry, I'm still learning too. Um, Magnolia Meadows is healthcare for our residents who will be there long term. And Poppy Place, we are in the process of becoming Medicare certified. So that means our residents who have short stays coming out of the hospital or after surgery will be able to go to Poppy Place and use their Medicare Part A benefits. So Poppy Place will be kind of be a rotating um, household and more of a rehab. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand? It's a very good question. It's a great question. Oh. How are you going to address a resident who's currently in Poppy Place but does not fit into the Medicare field? They stay, right? Yeah. So if we have residents that are currently in Poppy Place, whenever we transition to the new household and Medicare, they will remain in Poppy Place. Medicare is a benefit, not a determinator. Right. Right. But so it's not really geared toward long-term stay. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, I wonder. I wonder mm -hmm. One more time, please. Because it's not really aimed toward a person who's in long-term. And my husband is in mm -hmm. long-term in Poppy Place. Mr. Is Paul he still Mr. suitable to Poppy Place or should he? transition to a different neighborhood. Well, we're not gonna transition people for the sake of just moving them. Mm -hmm. So while he's there, he will stay there until something else occurs and he's no longer with us or if he goes to the hospital or wants to go someplace else. Um, like if he goes to the hospital and you th collectively decide that you'd rather not go to Poppy Place because there's too much hustle and bustle of people coming in and out, in and out, you want a quieter environment, then we, you know, look at that and decide what's the best location for you, your husband to be in. But he does not have to be under a Medicare A benefit to live on Poppy Place. It's just a benefit that's offered. Yeah. Once we get a Medicaid certified, we're not there yet. Yeah. We're working towards it. So the, that, I forget the term, that cohort of people, that group of people will move into the new Poppy Place mm -hmm. all together. And what will happen, we think over, we don't think, we know over time is that as the census, the number of people living in Poppy Place is reduced um, with people that are long-term care, they'll be likely replaced with people who are coming in short-term. So it will not be that we'll suddenly have, because last, you know, last week we had the director's dialogue or the week before and I showed you the census and I believe we were 57, I think, of 60 that were, we had three rooms that were available. We're not suddenly gonna have 40 rooms that are available to turn into rehabilitation. So we'll do that slowly. The, the other thing that's happening, and I don't wanna, hopefully I'm not being confusing, is that when the, all of the uh, work is done in healthcare, we'll end up with 20 more assisted living rooms. We currently have 42, mm -hmm. and I believe we'll end up with 64 mm -hmm. assisted living. So one of the things that we were working on is revisiting our assisted living 
and what qualifies there. So perhaps there's more we can do in assisted living requiring less people to be in a nursing household and having more availability for short-term type things. I think that's beneficial all the way around for, for folks. I think that's another way perhaps to answer your question. Yes. This is not a question for you, I don't think. It's historically, how were these names, like Poppy Place, etc., determined? I am not an English major, but I associate rosemary with remembrance. I associate poppies with opium. I don't know. Somebody, please. Magnolias are Southern. I felt like we watched some demented version of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I really don't know. So I was here. They actually did like a contest where staff and residents could make suggestions. And um, yeah, it's really funny because assisted living is like, we're in assisted living. That's where we are. So the residents over on the license side a lot of times don't even always pay attention to the names. But yeah, there's no rhyme or reason. Um, for it. Good question, Lois. It's just like, where are they getting these names? I did want to offer, though, um, if there is anyone here or if you know of anyone who hasn't recently been over to the licensed side and it's just this vague name, um, I would be happy and Lynette would be happy to take anyone who was interested, just familiarize themselves with the area, with the staff, because most of you are independent in here, I'd be happy to do that. And that way it's not just this name, you know, you have an actual association of the area and the staff, and that can also be comforting sometimes. Just something to remember. I would take on the issue of names real quick, because names have got to be a little bit of a joke because they're so confusing and all that. So why go through the effort of renaming? I had a very interesting conversation earlier today with a person who lives in a cottage home. He had recently read the book, and many of you may have read the book, um, Being Mortal. Mm -hmm. um, I've read it. It's a fantastic book if you haven't read it, Being Mortal. Um, and the, and the, conversation, the piece of it he said to me was, you know, historically, at the end of people's lives, because we had this idea that we're immortal and we don't want to face our mortality, at the end of our lives, we for, for years have institutionalized people um, when they need help or become, in, become dependent. And so you see images in your mind, this is what it used to be. Long rows, double corridors, shiny vinyl plank, uh, not shiny, but uh, little squares, shiny floors, fluorescent lights. And everybody's like this, en masse. People are drugged, and, and that's what long-term care was. People are institutionalized and robbed of their last years. But people still need care. So what we and others are trying to do is take the institution out of the care to create environments and an and organization that is not institutional and thereby taking away that institutionalization. And naming is just a small piece of that. Naming it uh, like a home um, takes away that it's unit B, that it's the south unit or the east unit or the second floor. Those kinds of terms are very institutional. And it's okay to be institutional, although it's a lot easier but it goes against what we're trying to do, which is to not institutionalize people when they need a little bit more help. So names are funny and they kind of get a laugh, but they're, they're an important, but a small part of what we're trying to do with, with healthcare. We could have chosen better names, I wouldn't give you that. <laughs> I've lived at Cedarfield in independent living for five years, and it seems to me that the criteria for admitting people to assisted living has changed significantly over that period of time. Is that true? 
which way? Can you describe that a little more? Um, people who <coughs> need, who are more dependent. Okay. Just clarify the question. I think I'm hearing you say, over the last five years, your feeling is that people need to be more dependent to qualify for assisted living? No. That the people who are admitted now are already more dependent, maybe one foot away from one level. Gotcha. Assisted living. Gotcha. So, is that true? Gotcha. Yes. So assisted living and independent living are two sides of the same coin in a way. A person moves to independent living is hale and hearty. Over time, um, people begin to, to fail some. And so I think your statement lends itself to, are people staying in independent living too long? And thereby moving no. to a system. I think what you're saying is people who are moving in, into independent living are requiring more assistance. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, So, uh, these questions are really good, guys. So, yes and no. We still use the same assessment tool, but when I started, the thought process was, Kathy, when you're meeting someone for the first time, we want them to stay five to seven years in independent living. That's what the protocol was for a life care uh, residency agreement because back then that was the only contract that Cedarfield would give with the resident is for life care. So they needed to make sure that you were healthy um, and going to stay in independent living. What happened was, was we were, and Paul correct me if I'm wrong, but we weren't including people who wanted to come to Cedarfield and that's when we came up with alternate contracts. So someone can have a life care, Someone can have a preferred choice contract. Someone can have different contracts. So that's why someone who doesn't, who comes in and doesn't seem as physically or cognitively able um, as say they were five years ago, are probably on a different contract, if that makes sense. So yes, you're right. Before there was one contract, one criteria, and that was everyone in independent living. Now you're seeing people, and part of that also was, again, couples. We couldn't let a wife in and not let the spouse in. So that's when we looked at, well, the wife is independent, so she qualifies for a life care contract, but maybe the husband has memory issues. So he actually couldn't be left in independent living by himself without supervision. So that's why we started offering um, other contracts. But you're, you're right with that assessment, that before there was just one contract that was offered for all of independent living. And if you didn't qualify, spouse or not, you just didn't come here. One, one of the things that I've noticed in, in my career, which is 30 years now, in June, this right now is my 30th anniversary, um, is that I've never, I don't believe I've ever worked in a community where the perception that something has changed and they're now letting people in who are more frail did not exist. Um, and I think it's because there's a mixture of people who come. Some people are really active. All of you got in. Um, sometimes there are folks who are a little less active and, 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 uh, and a little older. There is a mixture of things. and I. I have found, and I don't, I don't know this is true, so I should be careful what I'm saying, but to, in, in the last community I worked in, to help come out, I made a list of all the people that moved in, and me and a small committee looked at it and went, yeah, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. yeah, okay, not so hot, pretty good, pretty good. Um, and so it became more of a perception than a reality. Our mind stuck to what the narrative was without looking at the whole thing. That could be the case, might not be the case. But I, on the top of my head, since I've moved, since I've been working here, which is only five months, um, can think of lots of very healthy folks that have moved in, um, and I, that's my that's my thought. But I, I think your point is well taken. But I think we want to look critically, like a scientist would, at all the data. Um, is what I would say. 
It's a good question, though. Other questions? Yes. When a resident is being evaluated for a possible move to a different level of care, I know there is an assessment process and I've heard good things about it. My question is, does the resident fully participate in that and be, is being kept informed? Or does the resident kind of be on the sideline and the assessment is done by the family, the staff here? My concern would be if I were being assessed and not a full participant with comprehension of what was at stake. The answer to your question is the resident is the leader, the person in charge of the assessment. Mm -hmm. So the family is supportive to the resident, just like those that are assessing are supportive to the resident. So the center of the whole process is, in fact, the resident. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to give a little um, accolade to Adrian. I've worked under many administrators. She is probably the most resident-directed and driven administrator that I've ever seen, which is great. She's always like, well, what does the resident think? Or, well, the resident doesn't like that there's no trees out their window. Well, I wouldn't like that either. And I was like, wow, this is great. So that this is huge. It's a great person to work with as a social worker. Um, so when she says the resident is in the center, the resident is in the center. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. I think of a bell curve, because I'm so in proximity. Her science is just rubbing off of me. But there's a bell curve, I think. Of. There are sometimes when a person comes to us and says, I want to move to assisted living. Believe it or not, that does happen. <laughs> but it's on this side of the bell curve. Yeah doesn't happen often. On the other side of the bell curve is people who, I'm not moving, but their children see it, we see it, everybody sees it, it's just not safe, and we're gonna need to move, or we're gonna need to find another place to live, or find some other thing to do. Very rare, about as rare as, hey, I wanna move to assisted living, is the other one. In the middle is where most of the things are. It's sort of a, really, I don't know, and it's a dance back and forth until we finally get to a, yeah, this is probably what's in my best interest. That's oftentimes, I think, what, what happens. At no point is there a black ops, we're gonna grab you and <laughs> put a hood on your head and drag you away. <laughs> it's very much with you and your family and your doctor. There's no demerits either, that's often. <laughs> and um, I this will. Ordered the wrong thing. I will add also that when um, there are specific assessments that Kathy and I or Lynette will conduct, and we do those with just the resident. Oftentimes, I've kicked out family members, and I'm saying, "Hey, you know what? This assessment is just not." I mean, I was nice about it, she but them, she asked them to leave. <laughs> um, just because you know, we want to make sure that we're getting what you all want and we're not influenced by spouses or kids or anybody else. Other questions? Anything that you think when you leave this room, you might say, I should have asked that question. I was just too embarrassed to. You should ask it. Yes. Not a question, but just an observation. I've known at least three people who have moved to assisted living within the last year. A couple of them were wild about the idea. To a person, they have all said, this is exactly where I need to be, and I love it. Thank you. That is good to hear. Because people have been saying that about assisted living. I was talking to one gentleman, telling a story, the guy said, this is great, Sister Levin's great. And I was telling people, and they're like, 
Who'd you say that was? Because <laughs> he's not always as happy as you. Well, he loved the system. So I always tell people moves are hard. It's in the top five stressors. Um, it's hard physically. It's hard emotionally. There's a downsize involved. So you actually don't want to move when you're physically not well. You actually want to move in a perfect world, as I like to say, when you're actually, you know what, you're needing some assistance, but you don't have an acute episode going on where, oh my gosh, I can't control my bowels or I can't control whatever it is medically that's going on. It's hard enough to deal with that and then to move on top of it. So it's actually always better if you're thinking about it, think about it when you're feeling well, because we actually see, as, as um, Ann was saying, we moved seven people in the past two months to assisted living. And I tell the families ahead of time, you will see a little bit of a cognitive decline. Don't be alarmed, it's totally normal because so much is being thrown at you, whether it be staff or routines or everything that it's just almost a little too much. But then once they become familiar, they get a routine, they go right back. It's not better, as Ann says, because they're in the proper level of care. So that's so great to see. People at 99 telling me, Kathy, I think I need a little assistance. And I'm like, well, I think you deserve it at 99. So that's, uh, it's great when you see so many happy people over there. It is good. And the least restrictive care is what we're interested in. We're not interested in moving people who, there's some other intervention that's less restrictive, like, hey, all you need is a couple of hours of some care person to come in and help. That's fine. It's when you need eight hours, 10 hours, 24 hours that, that can become a problem. Um, people, if they want to stay in their apartment, and this is the joke, but I'm going feet first. <laughs> I'm leaving this cottage the day you take me out feet first. You can do it. It's okay with me. You just have to have the care. You can't be unsafe. What I will tell you is that if your life has come to sit in front of a TV with a personal care aide who's scrolling through their phone and you're watching The Price is Right all day, that's not much of a life. I will say that in assisted living, there's a lot of structure, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of people, and there's a lot of mental challenge that occurs uh, that's very helpful. Growing old is one thing, but isolation is really the problem. If you choose to move to a retirement community and then become isolated within the retirement community, you know, everybody can make their own choices, whether they're good or bad. It's what I want is not what's right for everybody, but it's something to consider. Feel like Mosey this afternoon. Uh, would you also speak to the fact that people who are in assisted living are welcomed to come back to independent living? It's not a separate place. Somebody on the panel want to? To eat, to mm -hmm. participate in that? Yeah, so it's, it's exactly what you just said. If you, just because you are in independent living, I mean, I'm sorry, assisted living or healthcare, that does not exclude you from utilizing the entire campus of Cedarfield. You're able to go to the atrium. You're able to go and go to main dining. You're able to still do all of those things. You can go to the library. You can go to Parkview and play Marjan or Bridge. So, hmm? Right, exactly. You're still able to participate in absolutely everything, just because, you know, some people call it the other side. We're still all the same side. It's one big house. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different places to live in the house, but it's all still the same house. It's just living in a place where you get what you need to be successful. Is this type of thing helpful to you? What's the total number of residents now? Because obviously we've added on another wing. So has that increased the number of people living here? I should know the answer to that question. I do not. I can tell you the number of homes that are occupied. But I, I lose track of the double persons. You know, the double occupancy. I know we have 313 independent living that are occupied. I know we have 
42, 40 of 42 that are Assistant. currently occupied, and we have 58, I believe, of 60 that are occupied. And we're going to round out somewhere into 500-ish people, but I don't know the exact number. So this kind of thing's not a, you know, sometimes not a comfortable topic, but I really believe that a well-informed public, you know, is good. So you know what's going on. Um, so we don't want to run and hide from any topic that you have and the levels of care is why you moved here. And so we want to talk a lot about that. Debating about what the next topic is going to be, I had planned for it to be the rehabilitation household for July. And to talk a little bit about that and how it works or how it will work and where we are in the process and all that kind of thing. At some point, we're going to tack on a conversation about emergency procedures um, so that we know in a congregate setting what the emergency procedures are, what you're expected to do, what we'll do, all those kinds of things. Um, I think in the end, there'll be about six topics in the series. This is helpful to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else from our panelists? Any final thoughts? No, I'm happy. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> we thank you for coming and wish you a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Do that again. A round of applause.